This is Ann yes. Jake, I'm one of the partner managers, and I'll be hosting the cloud track. Um, so thank you for participating in the solution fair. Uh, we hope you can take away um, a few good nuggets of information from the partners you'll be hearing from and their offerings around Salesforce, SAP, Power BI, utility network, and migrations to the cloud. If you do have questions, please enter them into the chat. If we have time at the end of each session, we'll take a few. Otherwise, we'll summarize them and send them over to you. Uh, so up first is Accenture Federal Services to speak about Salesforce, Esri integration, um, and Scott Rosner, um, the Solution Architect and the USDA Lead, will be presenting with Nick Whistler, Senior Manager, supporting the call. So I'm going to turn it right over to Scott because we were just a little bit late. So Scott, take it away. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Anne. I hope you can see and hear me and see my screen. Um, sure can. Uh, let me uh, get to the right page there. Um, so what I'd like to discuss with you today uh, is digital geospatial acreage reporting for USDA. Um, again, as Ann said, uh, my name is Scott Rosner and my counterpart Nick Whistler is also on the call. Uh, so I'll get right into it. Um, the customer I support for USDA is, is called FPAC, uh, Farm Production and Conservation. And, uh, they have a great mission to support farmers and ranchers in a variety of programs. FSA is one of the agencies, Farm Services Agency, and they uh, supply a, a lot of benefits and programs, including loans to farmers. Uh, Natural Resource Conservation Services have a lot of assistance that they provide to farmers and ranchers to help conserve their land uh, and help put in any improvements that need to be made. And then the uh, Risk Management Agency is also a part of FPAC, and they provide insurance uh, via um, insurance providers to farmers and producers, whether it's their crops, whether it's their land, whether it's their cattle, uh, they provide those benefits to them. Um, and one of the uh, common programs that both FSA and RMA have is, is acreage report. And uh, if a producer is involved in an FSA or even an RMA program, they're required to file an acreage report with USDA. And currently, or, or should I say, uh, the prior legacy workflow was a very manual process. Um, it was the producer sometimes would have to travel an hour or more to a county office to be there in person to sit with a, a county representative, uh, use a paper-based map and draw their farm on there, draw their field and what they've planted. They then have to uh, swivel chair, if you will, over to a manual data entry system um, with a, you know, sort of a, a legacy a screen and, and, and you know, you'll be able to see from the, the video, I'm going to show you sort of the, some of the pain that they went through. Uh, and there also was no geospatial component to this. It was very limited. Sometimes they'd get a little picture of, of their farm, sometimes they wouldn't. And so there was a huge business need to bring tabular and geospatial acreage reporting together in a single view. Uh, the mission is eliminate these paper maps and inc increase efficiency, increase not only the efficiency of uh, getting the producer in there, uh, but also processing the acreage report and providing good customer service, you know, improving that as well. Um, you know, the way that we did this is we combined Esri and Salesforce into a uh, consolidated solution where there was digitized maps within Salesforce. There was a lot of automated workflows for data entry, um, and it really did leverage the huge investment that USDA has in both Esri and Salesforce. And uh, you know, a couple other things uh, as I, you know, that I'll point out before the video plays is, you know, we used a very modern user-centered design for the interface too on both the map and Salesforce. Um, and we used a really good fully automated integration suite. So there wasn't this swivel chair that, uh, that had to happen. And, you know, we wanted to provide a good user experience for these users to get them to buy into this new uh, product that we developed for them. So I'm going to move on and, and show you a, a video that has a demo of it, uh, kind of talks, shows graphically what I've just talked about, um, and then we'll go from there. So give me one second here. Pop one over. All right. 
Um, hopefully everybody can see this video. If we can't, I'll stop and pause. But uh, When I came to USDA, one of my goals was to make it easier for you to get information, file forms, and to apply for assistance so you can spend your time and energies growing the food, fuel, and fiber that keeps our economy strong. Building off of Secretary Purdue's vision for the agency, farm production and conservation, set forth a plan to modernize and enhance the customer experience for farm service agency employees and farmers relying on USDA's services. Today, the USDA's Farm Service Agency, FSA, performs acreage reporting three times a year through a heavily paper-based process. This workflow requires in-person visits with producers to fill out paper maps, followed by entering information in an internal system, farms. Faced with these challenges, the Farmers.gov team collaborated with FSA to explore a future vision of geospatial acreage reporting that simplifies and digitizes the process. Together, they built a solution that reduces the need for paper maps, shortens overall manual administrative process time, reduces printing and storage costs, and lays the foundation for producer self-service options down the road. The new acreage reporting tool begins with the county office employee, searching for the producer's name, and completing a mostly pre-populated customer interaction receipt for service with a familiar farmer's identity flow. The producer-focused search, compared to the previous farm focused search, makes it easy to find the correct records and the pre-populated receipt for service that saves time and increases compliance. Once the employee saves, they're brought to a list and map that shows all farms associated with the producer. Begin reporting on a specific farm. They simply click on the farm number in the list and map. Previously, the process required meticulous and time-consuming procedures to locate, print, file, and retrieve maps before a meeting. Now, the employee producer can see all the data visually side by side in one interactive view and only have to capture the information one time. In the new tool, as soon as a farm is selected, the associated list of fields displayed, making it easy to identify and access what the producer wants to report, and showing current progress toward reporting and certifying the farm. For the first time, FSA employees can easily see, navigate, and interact with everything in the same screen. The producer data and geospatial representation are connected in real time. The map views and layers make it easy to toggle different satellite and USDA filters facilitating a more visual and accurate reporting view than the previous single view, typically black and white, paper maps. Employees can select fields by clicking either in the list or on the map to start adding producer crop data. Once a field is selected, the field details page loads, where FSA employees can enter the producer's crop information. The new intuitive user interface enables easy entry of information correctly the first time. For example, it prevents reporting dates in the future, keeps users from skipping required fields, and expands additional data fields as necessary based on user selections. Employees can also use their county's existing default codes. These are codes used for crop data that is frequently used in the county to save time. The user enters the code at the top, and the rest of the form pre-populates with the saved information. Often, producers have split their fields to grow multiple different crops. The prototype allows employees to create and merge subfields directly in the digital application, rather than drawing on a paper map and then entering the subfields and data in the system after. In the new solution, the employee uses a set of draw tools to mark where the producer shows their subfields. The system even estimates the acreage of the subfields, and users can confirm or edit that amount. After the county office employee finishes entering data for each field, the acreage report is complete and ready for certification. The review and certify page allows employees to view each of the producer's fields and the status, fully certified, partially certified, fully reported, partially reported, all on one screen. The shopping cart menu provides employees with easy navigation to the correct field to complete certification. The review and certify page also makes it easy to print the correct document for signing. In future phases, the system will implement e-signature and online document storage, 
to further eliminate paper from the process. Once the FSA employee has printed and had the producer sign a document, they click Certify. The employee then receives a successful confirmation that the system of record has saved all the new data. As the system evolves, our end goal is to empower producers to take the entire acreage reports from home, saving a trip to and from the county office, and reduce the hectic environment during reporting season for employees. The future vision of digital geospatial acreage reporting will reduce the burden and physical costs of reporting. It will save FSA employees and producers time and money so they can focus on the work that matters. I hope everybody was able to um, hear and see that and enjoy the, the background music. Um, and uh, take questions. I don't know if we have more time. I know you guys are running late, but I'll look to you for some guidance. Yeah, we can we can capture questions and then we'll be sending those out after they're answered to everybody that was on the call. So thank you so much, Scott. Wow. Uh, we are now going to be moving over to the next session, which is with Quiet Professionals. And uh, Heather Buchanan, uh, geospatial strategist, and Scotty Gresham, cloud systems integration lead, will be speaking about their Cerebra Gray multi-purpose platform. I'm going to turn it right over to Heather. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation today. My name is Heather Buchanan, and I am the geospatial strategist at Cloud Professionals LLC. Also joining us will be Scotty Gresham, our Cloud Systems Integration Lead, and we are here today to share our trademark Cerebra Gray offering. Quiet Professionals is an SDB OSB based in Tampa, Florida, and we are an Esri Silver partner. We are uniquely positioned with a CTA that allows simple acquisition of Esri Tech and CP capabilities, as well as an MSA for IC efforts. Uh, Cerebra Gray is architected and designed for emerging trends and rapid innovation. Adapting an open and modular approach, the Cerebra Gray architecture allows for best of breed technology integration. This is a process and a framework that creates a collaborative workspace to use real-time processing, AI, ML, and advanced analytics of openly and commercially available data at the speed of information. Our framework supports decision-making at the edge from cloud and multi-cloud configurations through automation, data streaming in real time to give compute and AI at the edge. Stemming from lessons learned from incorporating closed systems such as Palantir, where data is locked in proprietary file formats, data and vendor lock, the demand signal really is shifting to an open standards approach um, of, to systems integration. Our adoption and use of ArcGIS Enterprise fully embraces this use of open architecture. In a recent conversation with the SOCOM commander, he stated, more and more I am finding our questions are, are on our high side networks, but our answers are on the unclass system. The QP framework refines processes and applies AI and ML and advanced analytics on publicly and commercially available data. And that data is visualized through ESRI's lightweight web apps and core desktop products that are customized to fit our clients' needs. All of this is supported in the government cloud, supporting FOUO, NIPR, and CIPR level security through DISA approved IL4, IL5, and IL6 infrastructure. We at QP have found a niche adapting an open and flexible architecture that allows best of breed technology integration. This methodology and, and framework for processing the real time data. IoT devices and sensor feeds, and applying data fusion through AI and ML and advanced analytics to provide critical decision points at the speed of information from the GovCloud to the edge. The modular approach allows QP to directly meet user requirements through a variety of workflows. For example, we scrape and pull data from the web from websites, RSS feeds, and enrich the content through NLP and OCR pipelines. The advanced analytics puts the content, puts, puts context from the content, providing the so what 
and we visualize the newly discovered knowledge through Esri's, Esri's apps to provide those critical decision points. Our customers to, uh, benefit from this modular approach primarily because we can offer them any number of deployment options to fit their needs. We can simply provide data as a service to leverage existing customer data, apps, and edge devices. And alternatively, we can, we can provide the data and processing, the analytics, as well as the end-to-end -end solution complete with cloud infrastructure and O&M services with optional analysts or other technical services. Simply put, simply put, we offer Esri and other tech in the cloud with QP services. The next few slides will cover a few examples of Cerebral Gray in action at custom sites. Here we lever, leverage planets Dove constellation orthorectified imagery at three to five meter resolution as a, sort, as a data source. Then we apply machine learning and computer vision algorithms to segment vessels from imagery. This, the algorithm results are automatically discovered by our RTI's GeoVent server and appended to existing feature classes. Finally, a customized ArcGIF operations de dashboard using Arcade to render symbols using clustering summarizes that information for command level decision makers. This is another example where we scrape publicly available information enrich it using OCR and NLP pipelines and present the analytical results and associated data points to decision makers. Here are a few examples where our QP analysts have applied advanced processing to publicly available APIs and provided the content to key stakeholders. I'll turn it over to Scotty to briefly discuss edge capabilities. Uh, a, key, a key attribute of uh, artificial intelligence is speed. We're essentially uh, in, over, in information over in overload uh, with too much information for humans to consume and make sense of. So today, for example, full motion video or lat long data of moving objects is gathered and sent to analysts where it's processed in the information used for decisions. Uh, the challenge is these data sets are huge, which makes the process uh, sometimes takes uh, hours or at best or even days or weeks. Um, although data for, for training AI models is very large, the resulting models uh, are quite small. So to extend Cerebra Gray's uh, capability further, uh, QP can train AI models in the cloud using dozens of virtual CPU cores or GPUs. Uh, then the models can be deployed uh, to small edge devices, a variety of sizes, uh, as small as an IC chip right on a sensor PCB, uh, to a handheld or, or man-carried system that leverages open source architectures like Kubernetes containers, uh, powered by traditional processes or even uh, FPGAs or field programmable data arrays, which is a near firmware level execution environment to enhance speed. With devices positioned at near edge locations, such as offices, uh, posts, or forward bases, or on the very tactical edge, uh, being carried by a human or an autonomous system, the environment can, process, can be processed quickly enough to make humans, uh, to make immediate decisions. Uh, using devices that can see the landscape through a camera and identify an object of, in, of interest, for example. And this tightens the OODA loop closer to real time. Uh, let me hand it back to Heather to close us out. Uh, and in closing, we're going to, we're showing a few of our major prime contracts and subcontracts available uh, for simplified acquisition. Uh, we will note uh, in a later presentation, uh, we'll cover our anonymized mobile device data service. Uh, which will be available in our Israel marketplace in the coming weeks. Uh, also, QP has a CT in place with Esri that allows us to sell Esri products and services. So if you have customers with difficulty purchasing Esri software, we likely have a contract vehicle in which they may transact. We really see ourselves as Esri brand ambassadors, and I will note that we helped the soft team transact over a million dollars in software over the past year. QP is open to discuss these, these options further, and to provide additional information and live demonstrations of, of our capabilities. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any additional questions or want to know more about Cerebra Gray and QP's capabilities. And we apologize for all the technical things. No worries. Thank you so much, <laughs> Shannon and Scotty. That makes it a for today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you so much. Uh, then we will now um, go on to our third partner to present, which is Critigen, and they will be speaking about geo-integration of SAP and Salesforce enterprise systems. 
Uh, the two presenters are Mike Edinburgh, VPSL's SA Partner Manager, SAP Partner Manager, and Ty Vandenecker, VP of uh, Market, or VP Part Product Manager and Salesforce Partner Manager. That's a that's a mouthful. Um, so I'll turn that right over to uh, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Well, welcome uh, everybody, and thank you for the time. Um, and my again, my name is Mike Eggenberger, uh, Vice President Responsible for Business Development and our SAP Partnership uh, Sponsor. Uh, joining me today is going to be Ty Vandenacker. Um, he's our Vice President Product Strategy, and uh, he's responsible for our Salesforce Partnership uh, as well. Um, so just a quick agenda uh, in our in our few minutes here. We'll talk a little bit about Critigen Federal Solutions. Um, and how we connect Esri to critical SAP business systems, and and um, and uh, how we connect uh, also Esri to uh, to Salesforce, in particular around mobile and mobility. Um, um, we are yeah, again we're an Esri part Esri partner platinum part. Uh, let's try that again. Um, Esri platinum partner have been for a long long time. Um, and really been working with Esri. I think we, we got our first ARC Info licenses back in 1987 when we were part of CH2M Hill um, and, uh, and, and became one of the first Esri partner, uh, Platinum Partners back in 2010. So long, 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 long history with Esri uh, in many, many industries, in particular in the federal space. Um, uh, we've earned several specialties, as, as you see here. And one of the things that is, that, that is a real differentiator for us, and I think it can really support um, the Esri Federal team, is, is our relationship with, with, with others, other primary vendors in your partner ecosystem, like SAP, like Salesforce, like OSISoft. This is really an important piece of the puzzle because not only are we able to take the Esri, um, the, the Esri um, technology and capabilities to market, but really um, you know, geo-enable uh, their enterprise and connect it to those other critical business systems. And that's something that, uh, that I think is, is important to appreciate and, and, and part of the reason why we're doing this, why we're talking about our SAP and Salesforce relationships. Um, you know, OSIsoft is another one that I think is important in, in a bunch of the work that we're doing with, uh, uh, with the Navy and Marine Corps. Um, again, a little bit about who we are. Uh, many on the call are probably familiar with us, um, but I'll just, uh, you know, talk a little bit about some of the some of the agencies and departments that we work with, um, as you can see up here. And uh, you know, as a service provider, one of the most important things, obviously, is is the bottom right, is is how we're rated. And you know, clearly skewing over to the to, to the correct side of the of the dial on that in terms of sort of what our capabilities are and, and how we're appreciated by our customers. So uh, uh, so lots of good work that we're doing in uh, in in the federal government space. Um, so again, you know, a little bit of our special thoughts here is really is is really connecting Esri to those critical business systems. Um, and uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the SAP piece, and Ty will talk more about the Salesforce piece. Um, one thing to kind of appreciate, I think, in this situation is that in very few situations are we connecting Esri to to only one system. It's typically, you know, we did we we did a, a recent piece of work for uh, for a uh, South Jersey Industries. It's a gas company where where it was part of 38 different systems that were that were being connected. So so more and more customers are seeing Esri and seeing their GIS and their spatial infrastructure as something that needs to be connected to the enterprise, and that's something that we that that we we really bring to bear. And it's where should we be connecting to SAP? Where should we be connecting to Salesforce? Is at least as important as how exactly do you technically do these things? So this next piece is, is you know, this SAP Esri Critigen better together. Um, many on the call might be saying, uh, might be saying, wow, SAP Esri, what's the big deal? We've been doing this for a long time. And, and absolutely, um, uh, SAP and Esri have been partnered for a long time. And the graph on, 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 on the left-hand side here really represents that. And some of you may have seen this as a, as a slide um, uh, that SAP and, and, and Esri show sometimes in uh, at conferences and other events. Um, and, and really what it's demonstrating is, yes, there's been this long, long partnership that's really accelerated um, uh, over time around, you know, products called GEF. And, and probably the most significant piece of the puzzle was when, was when HANA was certified as a, uh, as a certified platform for, uh, for ESRI. Um, and back in 2018, that what that's done is really enabled a whole lot of uh, of uh, much easier connectivity and integration between the platforms uh, that used to be done in a more traditional, you know, uh, interface kind of a way. Now there's a way to really be connecting it by by putting ArcGIS on HANA, 
uh, and connecting it to the enterprise, um, uh, you know, at a platform level. Um, and, uh, and lots of value can be seen from there. Uh, over on the right-hand side, it really demonstrates, you know, a surprisingly a subset uh, of where we've worked with, with enterprises on connecting SAP and Esri. And this is something that our customers have trusted us with um, for a decade, uh, starting with, uh, with the USDA, um, and so it's good to see there's just sort of more work going on with uh, with our farmers um, uh, in, in agriculture from uh, from our, our friends at Accenture. Um, but but you know since then we've done a whole lot of work and worked directly with Esri and SAP on as the technology has evolved and we've influenced how that technology has evolved and the integration patterns for them for at places like Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, uh, North Carolina, Sempra Energy, City of San Diego, et cetera. You can, you can see the logos here. And really what that re represents is, is, is how we've learned how to do this and, and not, not just how we've learned how to do this from a technical perspective, but really working with customers on, on what are the best ways to achieve value in ways that are not only gonna get them what they need today, but also how to evolve it and how to keep the, the total cost of ownership down and, and make sure that it is programmatic and capable over time. So the next point here is really so geo enablement. Again, let's reimagine how this is, how this needs to work. And, and as we've worked with, with, uh, with Esri and, and SAP and our customers, there was always this, what's the ROI? Show me the, give me the business case, give me the use case that's gonna be the killer app that will cause an organization to, to deploy these kinds of uh, technologies. And, and really there's, what we found was there's no single use case that will drive the adoption of RTS and HANA and do these things. The important piece it, it, that we really found was, was there needs to be a, a, a strategic um, engagement with, um, from an agency or an organization with, uh, with SAP and ESRI as strategic, in, a, in a strategic partnership. And, and once that has occurred, you know, then we can say, well, there's no single killer app to, to, to cause this kind of investment. But programmatically, and from a from a foundational perspective, each uh, each application will add more value to this strategic direction of, of uh, an, an engagement within the ecosystem. So as quickly as possible, what we do is we get briefings with with leadership, and and in whatever the titles are, uh, it's dealing with the CIO, GIS head, and SAP heads, and really asking these couple of questions: Is SAP a strategic part of the organization? And it doesn't mean that they are only using SAP, but it is, are you using SAP? Um, and are you not just using it, but is it a strategic partner? And number two, is Esri a strategic partner? And hopefully we already know the answer to those and we're getting them, we're getting some confirmation. And, and if the answer is yes, then they are on the road to HANA. You know, SAP is, is shifting and, and they keep moving their dates out a little bit, but, but really um, everything is moving over to HANA over time. Um, and, and with the now the, the two-year-old announcement of HANA being a certified geodatabase, uh, then it, it really makes the conversation an easy one. Well, it, it may not make sense to, to, to put Esri on HANA now, but when are you going to do it? Because it is, it, it is now an important piece of the foundation and has some special capabilities that are important to, um, to appreciate. Um, so that's really an important piece of this is, is, is it's really programmatic um, in nature and foundational, um, but there can be some very, um, but it doesn't have to be a huge waterfall program. There can be some really quick benefits that can be achieved um, uh, from, uh, uh, from once that decision has been made. And, and again, what's, what's, how do you get there once you're into an, in, into an organization? It, it's really, it's a two-step process to, 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 to take, a look at, take a look at the specific uh, situation within your organization, um, have that meeting, and it really starts off with, let's unify the platform. Um, um, and, and, and let's unify the platform. Let's put at least some of, uh, of Azure's technology into HANA. Um, and um, usually starting with a publication geodatabase, it's some kind of a system of engagement or system of insight. Specific use case, again, is not particularly material. Um, and um, typically there's gonna be some kind of, uh, of folks there that are, you know, look at this change as being something that's going to hurt them. So let's try to, get, let's try to knock down some of those objections and let's try to gain some traction. 
a test drive in COIL. COIL is the co-innovation lab that uh, um, uh, sort of an external place that we can we can sandbox some things, or even better, stand up when in in their own organization. And then once we've got that single uh, single situation, uh, working with the organization to sort of deploy more and more and more uh, in an uh, in a geo-enabled fashion. And what this, as we call it, uh, you know, the sunrise slide is really what that that's what this represents. It's really any of those any of those points going out there it could be hr it could be customer it could be supply chain it could be procurement it could be you know the easy you know the most the most typical one is around enterprise asset management but there's plenty of places where this could be uh, where we could be taking advantage of it and i certainly don't need to describe to a, a crowd of, of esri folks um and, and partners um why things will do better you know viewed on a map or taking or taking location into into consideration and finally, let me hand it off to Ty Vandernacker, who will talk a little bit more about uh, our Salesforce uh, uh, partnership. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so th anyway, that was really fun to see that go into the Salesforce browser experience. And, and that, was, that was right in the sweet spot of Salesforce CRM for the browser. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is our partnership with Salesforce around uh, mobility and connecting ArcGIS to the Salesforce mobile tools. Um, in particular, most people are familiar with Salesforce uh, as a CRM company. Um, certainly that's where they started, but they've grown like crazy, um, well beyond just CRM. So field service is a huge business for them now. Um, it's not the same as CRM, it's connected to it. Their um, kind of their slogan is customer 360. So when you're out in the field, you're often serving a customer. Um, they're moving toward an asset 360 as well. And, and so my, my goal here today is just to give you a little bit of education on some of the things Salesforce is doing so that we can really target the right places uh, with Salesforce opportunities. Um, so, so think about field service and, um, and sales, using Salesforce for field service. Uh, a lot of companies will try at, at small scales to kind of cram some work management stuff into GIS and that works fine at small scale and same uh, they'll kind of cram some some kludgy spatial stuff into a work management system but really there aren't any good systems out there that do an awesome job at both work management and gis so that's where lemur comes in um, there's a real careful architectural setup where salesforce field service has the work orders um, it's a system of record for those um, Salesforce does field service scheduling and optimization, and they go way, way, way beyond uh, travel times and those sorts of things. They get into skills and availability and multi-day work with handoffs and regulatory requirements. It's very impressive uh, what they're able to do with scheduling and optimization of a, of a workforce. And then Lemur provides the, the ArcGIS information and the tools that they need to see and to do their job safely and efficiently. And we connect those two things very closely. So Lemur is an Esri runtime app, and that's really important because it's offline capable. And the Salesforce apps just are not built on technologies that are capable of using that native runtime that provides that great offline experience. So Lemur is really a key piece to them there, and we have a productized integration between Lemur as a mobility app for GIS and the Salesforce field service product. Um, that allows us to deploy things very quickly. Um, we've designed Lemur specifically for these kinds of field service use cases. Um, there, there's a couple of key things there. The first one is that we really try and simplify it so they don't have to become GIS experts. Um, we build in workflows, um, markups, red lines, and all those sorts of things that as GIS people were really familiar with. Um, we put that into a workflow, give them specific palettes like you see there on the slide, depending on what specific type of task that they're trying to do. So we make that really simple and straightforward. We put it into workflows that are specific to their industry or their task. And that allows us to put, um, put this Esri technology into the hands of hundreds or even thousands of technicians or, or new users at an organization and have the support and the maintenance and the training and all those things be very reasonable. Um, that, that's driven largely by configuration because everything in Lemur is configured. So that, that's a key place. Um, I think we're just about out of time. I've got a little bit of the stack listed here, uh, but look forward to receiving questions and, and responding to those as well. All right. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, we're going to probably just um, make sure that we collect all the questions and then uh, send those out to you if there are any, and then uh, we can get the answers back to all the folks on the line. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. All right. And now um, the next discussion is with GIS Inc. about how Esri's utility network meets cloud services for modernized infrastructure management. So with me, I have Dan Levine, President, and Mike Parma, Water Solutions Architect, who will be delivering the presentation. So I'm going to turn it right over to Dan. Thank you, Ann. Uh, mm -hmm. You guys hear me? Sure can. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so we wanted to uh, talk about cloud services but with the, uh, the theme of the utility network. And, and part of that is because, frankly, don't see a whole lot of that uh, utility network on the federal side. But we're starting to get inquiries about it. So we thought it'd be an interesting way of uh, both showing our cloud prowess as well as some utility network activity. Mike, go to the next slide for me. So, you know, when Jeff Peters took over his current role, uh, he put a big bogey on the board. I think it's like double the revenue in five years or something. I, I get it, man. That translates down to a lot of pressure to Patty, Brian Cross, and then down the chain to uh, all the account managers and uh, professional services and solution engineers, et cetera. Um, you know, when, when I go and visit Patty or Laura Dolores, they're sweet as pie to me, but I bet that's a much more tense often with, with the rest of you guys. And, and one of the ways that I, I, I think you all are going to get to that bogey that Jeff put on the board is to, to working with partners, trusted partners that you know can do the work. Um, so we've been a partner with Esri at the highest levels for really 30 years, our entire existence. And, and one of the things we do to maintain that level is to make sure that we're fresh with the specialty designations. Uh, there's a couple of them here, but we, we effectively have all of the specialty designations available. And we, we like to be one or two out of the gate with that. So we, we actually help with the, the specialty designation process as you go. Um, and, and the fact that uh, like, Critch and gentlemen before us uh, are in commercial space and state and local space, we get to kind of drive that new technology early on and test it because oftentimes the federal market is a bit of a laggard in getting that stuff. So by the time that the feds are ready for it, we've kind of gotten the whip marks and it's a much cleaner solution. But we've been successful in going to market with uh, ESRI for years and years and have a nice list of good, strong CPARs um, and successful clients. And, and the way we like to go to market with y'all is first off proactively coordinating with the AMs or professional services to get out ahead of a particular opportunity and set the our go to market strategy and start evangelizing way ahead. And once we win that, we'll execute those projects and programs successfully. We, we've got a long, long history of doing that. And one of the ways we've been successful that is often we end up working with the product teams to address some of the early issues we find in version one or 1.2 and uh, if there's either functionality or performance issues, kind of working that out with, with uh, the product teams. And then finally, we're leaving happy clients behind that are winning SAG awards, and then most importantly, aren't reluctant to sign the next ELA and, and even size it up a little bit. So with that little commercial, I'm gonna hand it over to Mike to talk about some of the details of the, the UN, the cloud work we've been doing. Um, and again, uh, I, I want you to be thinking about it. You may not have heard too much of utility network in the Fed space, but it, but it is coming. And uh, I just want you to keep us in mind and give me a call when, when you see that stuff. So Mike, I'm gonna hand it off to you, take it away. All right, thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Excuse me. So today we'll talk briefly about the utility network and the cloud. Uh, we'll cover a few things you need to know, uh, what you can expect and uh, some required actions. So first, what you need to know. GIS Inc. implemented our first cloud solution using Amazon in 2009. Uh, since that time, uh, the number of implementations has steadily risen, and perhaps because of COVID, this year has seen a dramatic increase. Uh, this trend matches that of general cloud adoption across the technical industry. Increasing adoption has top providers competing for your business, uh, driving down cloud service costs, and we believe it's a perfect time to look at cloud services if you haven't already. Now, as you probably already know, Esri released the Utility Network Management Framework um, into production early last year. Uh, the UN is uh, a technology modernization effort uh, meant to bring modern IT best practices to network management. Its primary distinguishing characteristics 
our service oriented architecture, business logic embedded within the database, and cross platform support. The UN brings the capability to model, edit, and analyze complex network systems across the entire ArcGIS platform. Most of the advanced functions of its predecessor, the Geometry Network, were limited to the desktop environment. That's not the case with the UN. The UN also introduces a high fidelity data model, allowing more granular and more accurate capture of both linear and vertical assets. These can be captured using containment and associations, which allow for advanced tracing while also not cluttering the map in very dense areas. While the geometric network has served us all well for 20 years, the UN is expected to provide the technological foundation for the next two decades. The full enterprise version of the UN requires all the components of ArcGIS Enterprise, uh, server, portal, pro, the relational database, um, to provide a multi-user environment. Beginning at 10.8.1, licensing is now managed through portal user type extensions. We highly recommend deploying on the latest version at the time of your implementation. For smaller utilities or early prototyping on a larger project, organizations may wish to consider deploying the water distribution system foundation solution in ArcGIS Online to quickly become familiar with the data schema, though without the network capabilities. There's even an option to deploy a fully functioning UN in a file geodatabase for a single user with no special licensing. These last two options are great for prototyping or jumpstart styles of projects. A typical cloud environment might look something like this with the external web application separated from the internal ArcGIS enterprise components. In this case, we have redundancy for a passover failure or failover. Your ArcGIS desktop is accessed through VMs, virtual workspaces, or services like AppStream. The UN basically sits as functionality within the ArcGIS enterprise, either on shared or dedicated servers as needed for performance. Now, what can you expect from the UN and cloud? Modern workflows require mobility. Common devices like smartphones today weren't even around when the geometric network came to be. The UN is designed to support network functionality across the entire Esri platform, whether desktop, web, native apps. Truly any device, anywhere, anytime. Now this is enabled through services-oriented architecture, ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Enterprise, feature services, and geoprocessing tools. A high fidelity data model allows for more granular and accurate real world representations of the assets with explicit connectivity rules, asset directionality, terminals, containment and association, managers and operators can expect data to function much more like its physical counterpart during analysis. And finally, with those rules, Esri is trying to make it hard for users to make bad data. With business logic in the database, configurable levels of tracing, and 3D support for vertical assets, this is the next generation of network management. Now, what does the cloud offer? I think it's best to categorize the benefits into four areas. Capabilities include things like legacy replacement, load balancing, serverless computing, elastic storage, automatic updates. Performance means things like optimization, infrastructure, scalability, elasticity, reliability, and redundancy. For cost, you're trading capital expense for variable expense, thus avoiding your hardware refresh. You'll have options for economies of scale, pay as you go, or just for what you use. And finally, with security, there is maintaining security of the physical facility and also the shared data security models. Now with this notion that your data is stored on servers and systems that you don't own or directly control, there are myths that cloud computing is inherent, inherently less secure than traditional approaches. However, that's not actually the case. Physical precautions include things like high fences, barbed wire, concrete barriers, guards that patrol the area, uh, and security cameras. 
employees, vendors, and visitors are physically separated from a company's mission critical data. Providers have access not only to the best data centers, but also to highly skilled IT teams. And finally, they undergo regular audits to protect against flaws in their security systems. Now, it should be noted that Azure and Amazon both offer dedicated hosting environments meeting stringent federal security specifications. They are architected to meet US DOD security requirements for cloud computing, specifically for data designated as DOD impact level five per the DOD cloud computing security requirements guide. Your cloud imp implementation can be rather simple or more robust as we see in this client example of an ArcGIS enterprise environment complete with GeoEvent, portal, and system monitoring. Rather than purchasing and maintaining hardware in your local server room, these ser virtual servers and cloud environments can be spun up and configured together just as if they were on-prem. In most cases, making changes to address shifting needs is much simpler than with locally hosted options. Now, the UN is designed to be flexible for today's modern IT practices. In a recent example, one of our clients had a locally accessed VDI, which was unable to support ArcGIS Pro, specifically due to the graphics cards. A virtualized environment located in a different state hosted the UN database and the feature services. We then configured Amazon AppStream, which does support Pro, allowing our client to run Pro through this thin desktop streaming service to connect to the remote UN. All locations were in different states and they performed very well together. Now the GIS manager for one of our other water clients has generally worked remotely from home using VPN to get to a jump box located back in the office. And when COVID hit, his jump box was now his primary machine and it was now at the house. With everyone now working from home, their VPN tunnel quickly became saturated in just a matter of minutes, he was able to reconfigure his ArcGIS Pro project, connect directly to his secure but publicly accessible UN feature service, and continue editing uninterrupted while not further impacting VPN traffic. Now finally, what do you need to do? UN and cloud impl implementations each have their own project milestones, though with some similarities. They can be implemented separately or together in a combined approach while each meeting their own respective milestones. Now, this is a possible implementation approach. There isn't a set in stone way to do this. This is just what we have found works when trying to prepare a client. Some steps will overlap or iterate. The basic steps are to perform our readiness assessments to lay out the roadmap, clean our spatial data and inventory server content, implement the, the technical platform, plan our migrations of our spatial data into the UN and also that server content, plan for business system integrations, <clears throat> implement the migration plan, and finally educate your users on the new platform access and utilization. In summary, Remember that cloud adoption rates continue to increase and that Esri is updating network management to meet current and future IT best practices. The cloud can offer improvements in your overall IT server management practices. The UN is redesigned to take advantage of modern IT infrastructure, work across all platforms and devices, allowing workflows to move out into the field and improving real world representations of your network assets. It really is the future of network management. And finally, you'll need to build a roadmap, plan your content migration, implement the technical backbone, reconfigure your system integrations, and perhaps most importantly, prepare your users. GIS Inc. has offerings to help organizations with all aspects of the cloud and UN journeys. But for those just getting started, we recommend a readiness assessment. So on behalf of Dan, myself, and the rest of our team at GIS Inc., we appreciate your time and attention this afternoon. Please contact either one of us to get started with your cloud or UN implementations today. 
Great. Thank you so much, Dan and Mike. Thanks for participating as well. So for those on the line, we do have a break at this point from 2.30 to 2.45. However, I just want to let you know that the next couple of cloud uh, presentations will start at 3.15. Um, so that will be with Blue Raster and Rock. So enjoy your break. We'll see you soon. Bye. Welcome back, everybody. I just want to um, kick off the next session of the cloud uh, track with Blue Raster. And they will be talking about um, power, the power of ArcGIS and Power BI. Uh, Phil Satloff, the program manager, and Shannon Lindsay, uh, Power BI lead, will be presenting and showing you a demo as well. So I'm going to say, take it away, Phil. Thank you, Ann, and I want to uh, thank Esri for giving us this opportunity and everybody who's spending a little bit of time with us today. Thank you very much. Um, to uh, reiterate, I'm Phil Satloff, a program manager, and I have with me today Shannon Lindsay, our Power BI lead. Um, so a little bit about us. We're a uh, GIS, a web application, a business intelligence consulting company. Uh, we've been in business for about 20 years and we're located in Arlington, Virginia, right outside of DC and just a few blocks away from the Esri R&D Center. Uh, we are a, a gold partner with Esri. We've been fortunate enough to win uh, several awards and we're also a Microsoft partner as well. Um, these are a few of the groups we've been working with specifically Power BI and integrating with ArcGIS. The ArcGIS uh, visual for Power BI has gone through many um, revisions uh, lately. It's getting better and better. And uh, you can see we have a blend of federal and state and NGOs and uh, business organizations. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about why you might want to use the ArcGIS maps for Power BI Visual, a couple of use cases from our real-world experiences, and then a demo of just how easy it is to get started. Um, so the ArcGIS maps for Power BI Visual is its very powerful. That word comes up a lot. Um, it comes right out of the box with Power BI. If you have Power BI, you have the ArcGIS maps and Power BI Visual. You can tell all of your, your clients and your users this already. Um, you don't have to have an organizational account or any account with Esri to use it, but if you do, you get a lot more. Um, and of course, it's built for taking all that data you have loaded in your data model in Power BI and then interacting with it on the map. And how can your customers use this? And how can our customers use this? Well, it comes from that interest in Power BI. There are a lot of groups out there that either have been using Power BI for the past couple of years, it's relatively new, um, or other BI, and they moved into Power BI, and they always want to do something interesting with mapping. They want multiple layers. Maybe they're not super familiar with Esri or ArcGIS, but they've heard of it. or they have an S3 ArcGIS organizational account, they have some rich content, and then for some other reason, maybe there's another group in their organization that is heavy into Power BI and they want to be able to integrate the, the two data sets. Um, again, um, you don't have to have an account, but if you do, you get a lot more. And now we're gonna run into a couple of demos that Shannon is gonna lead for us. I'm gonna go on mute. Thanks so much, Phil. We are going to jump right into a demo of how we are using this with our current client. And then we're going to do a little bit of a build just so that you can see exactly how easy this is to use. So the first use case that we wanted to talk to you guys about is actually a project that we're working on called Tracking with Recency Assays to Control the Epidemic. The epidemic that we are referring to here is the HIV epidemic, and we're working on a PEPFAR-funded CDC initiative that is implemented by the University of California, San Francisco, and Columbia University. Um, we as Blue Raster are supporting them to use real-time data to identify hotspots of current HIV transmission. 
The reason that this is important is because when you are recently infected with HIV, your viral load is higher, which makes the disease more transmissible. So if we can locate individuals that are recently infected with HIV, get them on drugs right away, we can stop the epidemic, which is huge. So what we wanted to show you here is how we are integrating Power BI and the ArcGIS map visual. Um, the, the clients came to us and they said, we really need advanced geospatial analysis, but we also want to use Power BI. So we want you to help us use both. And it was a journey for us. And here's what we've ended up with. So if a um, medical officer who's responsible for, let's say a district, wants to use this tool, they'll come into Power BI and we're just looking at Power BI in the web interface right now. Um, and they wanna say, okay, I'm interested in understanding all of the clients that are recently infected with HIV in district one. And maybe they then come in and they take a look at the data by sex and they say, hmm, what's going on with these males in the 25 to 29 age group? They can then select that data and you can then see on the map, of course, where exactly those clients are located so that we can reach them. Now, what you see here is uh, a bit simple, particularly when it comes to geospatial analysis, but Phil is going to walk us through a little bit more that we were able to do. As Shannon referred to, um, uh, the organization that actually uh, is the sponsor of this for us is the ICAP team from Columbia University School of Public Health. And they no, they were aware of the power of ArcGIS Online, but they strongly wanted to use Power BI. And they knew they wanted more out of the, the map. So this is an example here where if you're using this Power BI service, you can take data, you can, in this case, we're using a Python script to move the data out of Power BI actually into uh, ArcGIS Online. We built an operations dashboard or dashboard that has a lot more functionality in it that the client's looking for. And then we're able to actually embed it back into the Power BI service here so that the, the project sponsors or the high level executives, they can go to one place, they can see their Power BI data, they can see that ArcGIS integration there, and then they go to the next tab and they see an even deeper ArcGIS integration. So we've been able to get them really excited both about Power BI and about going further with ArcGIS, which has been great. So Shannon is going to show a little bit about how you can build one of these. All right. Thanks so much, Phil. Um, so, so far you've seen a use case. We keep telling you that it's pretty simple to implement. And that's what I really like about Power BI and ArcGIS together. Um, the barrier to entry is low. And that is why the University of uh, ICAP, uh, sorry, Columbia University decided to use both Power BI and ArcGIS for this solution. So when I mentioned that the barrier to entry is low, let's build it. Um, so what you can see here on my screen is Power BI Desktop. This is where people ingest data, build out a data model, transform the data, and then you're able to build your visuals. So what we're gonna do today is just drop an ArcGIS map right onto the canvas. So in the visualizations pane here, we're just gonna grab our ArcGIS maps for Power BI. And here you can see that I am actually already signed in with my organizational account. And we're gonna show you why that's important in just a moment. Um, the first thing that I'd like to do is to get my location information onto the page. So we are, we're looking at the same use case here. So we wanna look at where the recent infections are. So I'm gonna start by pulling in the latitude and longitude of my health facilities. May the demo gods be with me here. And what we're looking at here is fictitious data, just so that everyone knows. Um, we are looking at this data by facility. And what I'd like to see on the map is my recent infections. So I'm gonna find that field here. These are our rapid tests for recent infections, our recents. And I'm gonna drag that into the size field well. From here, what you can see now is that our map shows our health facilities with the number of recent infections. Let's make this a little bit more intelligible and let's add some more data. I'd like to look at this by sex. 
and I'm going to drag that into the color field well. And now you can see here, okay, this is becoming a little bit more useful. Um, I'm going to jump out of the map quickly and drop a couple of other visualizations on the page just so we can all see how that works. And then we're going to come back to the ArcGIS map and Phil's going to help us build it out to make it better. Um, so the first thing that I'd like to do is just to build out um, a couple of other visuals on the page so that we can demonstrate how they all interact. So the first thing I'm going to do is just drop a date slider onto my canvas. And what this enables us to do is to look at the data by the specified dates that are found within our data model. Um, so that is our first visual we're going to add. And you can see here how the map adjusts accordingly. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a bar chart. Okay, and in this bar chart, again, I want to see the recent infections. That is the variable of interest. I'm going to drag that into my values. And then from here, I want to see them by district. That's important to me. So I'm going to take my district field as my axis. And again, I want to look at the sex element. And now you can see that we have a bar chart that shows us by district the male and female number of recent infections. And again, you can cross filter between your ArcGIS map and your data that exists in the Power BI data model so that you're able to interact with the data and see and drill down to exactly the area where you need to be. So let's jump back into the map and let's do a little bit of customization. So the first thing that I wanted to take a look at is the symbology of the map. That's often the first thing that we're going to want to customize. So I'm actually going to jump into the formatting paint roller on the visualizations pane in Power BI. I'm going to take a look at my layers and I'm going to turn the anchor on. From here, what you'll see is your legend, which also serves as the pane where you're going to make your customization. So from here, I am going to open up the symbology. And I just want us to take a look at the options you have in here. So um, we are able to transform the map in any way that we really need to. In this case, we're looking by size and by color. We can also change the symbol style, the transparency, the classification types, and the color ramp for our visual. The next thing that we may want to adjust is to add um, a base map, give us a little bit more context. So I'm going to go ahead here and just select the imagery base map. I want to be able to see what's going on in the country. And then from here, we're going to do a little bit more customization. And this is where the real power of this visual comes in. And I'm going to have Phil walk us through this. Sure. Um, and if you'll notice there, uh, you can, if you're an organization that has a collection of your own base maps, you can also use those. Um, but in the analysis tools widget, there are some really, really uh, great options for adding data and context. You can actually make a little infographic card that will sit right on your map canvas that pulls data automatically out of Esri's data sets, a living atlas or demographics data set. So if you wanted some contextual information, it responds to the map too, so it can show you what the population of the area you're zoomed into might be. Um, there's also the reference layer um, widget. Now this is really where a lot of power comes in. No, you can't do this anywhere else in Power BI. Um, here you can grab in data that Esri has curated and put out there for anybody to use, even if you have no account, like I said before, or if you do have an account, you can use a lot more of the data, or your own data, your own curated data. So in this case, we're going to pull in a web map, actually. This web map has multiple layers of reference data on it. So we put together a, a map that has um, some HIV prevalence data, as well as some simple boundaries for our districts. And you can begin to see that, hey, if I, I've got my, power, my data in Power BI, that's put in there through my custom data model. I've really done a lot of work to make that data exactly how I want it. I can filter it. I can visualize it with my charts. But now I can begin to stack up layers in my map to show just a lot more information 
that goes along with that data. And you can also, you can get pop-ups from your reference data. So there's just a world of possibilities there. Um, and you can have data in ArcGIS Online or it can be in Enterprise. Um, both of those are supported. And there's also a drive time widget that's built into uh, the analysis tool. So you could do a custom radius or a drive time. And so, you know, if we're trying to figure out where's our population that's within a certain amount of time from one of our districts, it's built right in there into the tool. Um, and of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You've got a lot of smart mapping stuff right here in the ArcGIS for Power BI Maps visual and pull in your organizational content and together it's very powerful. So uh, thanks again for giving us this opportunity. Please uh, give us a shout. Uh, we have a phone that still works, so please call it. And we have email as well, so please reach out. And uh, Shannon is also the Power BI user group lead for Washington, DC. So uh, attend that if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phil and Shannon. That was great. So um, we'll turn this now over to our final presentation from Rock Technologies. Alex Coleman, Business Development Lead, will be presenting on how moving GIS to the cloud revolutionizes the remote work experience. So right now, I'll turn it over to Alex. Take it away. Hi, hey, welcome. And can you actually see my presentation? I want to make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Yep, we can, and we can see you. So you're good to go. Well, all right, halfway there then. All right, well, thanks. And I appreciate, Esri, thank you so much for having us. And I also wanna say that it's it's been a real pleasure just watching all the other partners up until this. It's been nice being on the tail end. Um, there's obviously a lot of exceptional talent and it's a really super partner ecosystem. So it's been great to be a part of that. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm Alex Coleman, I'm the Business Development Manager at ROC. And we are going to talk about a little bit first about who ROC is. Uh, why people are going to the cloud. We'll be quick about that because I think we all know those reasons. Um, and really dig in though more into the process. So what it takes to get some of these larger or more complex organizations into a cloud environment. What type of services are out there that can help them maintain and grow in those environments? And then wrap up if there are any questions. So first and foremost, a little bit about, whoop, went, went too fast there, a little bit about uh, Rock Technologies. We've actually been around since 1997, have, have uh, been as a business partner since then. Uh, started off as a custom app development house, and then many, many years ago, uh, procured an ASP license and got our cloud chops actually taking the organizations that were taking advantage of that ASP, uh, moving those folks into the cloud. So long before, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, companies and governments were considering a cloud, we were actually managing uh, you know, multiple clients in, in, in that environment. And that's really where we got to learn about you know, the behavior of the software, uh, different types of architecture and how it works or it doesn't work, uh, and really got our chops there. And then in 2016, made a, a very strong decision to focus the entire, uh, to focus our entire business just on uh, managed cloud services for GIS. So we have, you know, our staff is made up of both AWS and Azure um, certified folks, as well as um, GIS and IT staff. And that's literally 24 seven, seven days a week. All we do is um, look at organizations and architect out environments for them, get them into a cloud and then provide ongoing management managed services. So why the cloud? We've talked about that a lot, and we've had there's some great you know companies that came before that that outline these reasons. So I don't I don't want to bore everybody with a rehash. Um, the one thing I will say that you know we've seen over the last maybe two years that might be different is we're hearing people where before there used to be a concern about security, right? It's like we don't want to move to the cloud because of security. Now what we're hearing more and more, especially in the government space and even in uh, is that they're moving to the cloud for security. Uh, it's interesting when you look at, you know, the number of, uh, you know, hacks and, uh, you know, just data being compromised that's going on these days. A lot of it's happening on premise and that's happening for a lot of different reasons. But, you know, when you go to the cloud, there's such a mature, incredible landscape of tools that are available to really lock down these environments. And I think people get that now. 
And so, you know, more we're starting to hear that security is actually a driver rather than a deterrent. Um, so that, you know, coupled with all of the other reasons that were discussed, right, the ability to scale and, and all of that good stuff is, is really just continuing to drive this movement. And we just see it accelerating, especially with everything we've all had to deal with this year and the remote work that was thrown to a lot of organizations that frankly weren't prepared. And I will say that, you know, once, you know, people are in the cloud, it, it's truly incredible the fact that, you know, literally every organization I think that we work with, we work across multiple verticals, all right? So we, we don't just serve government clients. We have, you know, utilities, we have Fortune 100 companies, we have um, engineering firms. I mean, you name it, and we're serving those groups, but they all say the same thing. And it's that the cloud has really kind of taken the handcuffs off their ability to expand their GIS workloads, right? They, we've seen organizations start off, you know, with a base deployment, and that now they have, I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable though. You know, now GeoEmbed's running, they've got insights going. They, you know, oh, let's, let's install Monitor. What about business analytics? Um, their ability to really take advantage of everything that's out there when it comes to GIS and how that can help their organization. You know, it, it becomes possible because they don't have to wait for, you know, an on-premise server to get purchased. They don't have to wait for, you know, uh, an IT group to say, okay, we'll spin up a machine for you. They really can scale at a point that, you know, prior was just literally, was impossible. Um, and in addition, you have all these third party applications, you know, that are coming into play. I know Critigen talked about a couple earlier with like SAP and Salesforce. And, you know, those require, in a lot of cases, environments that can scale, you know, that can deal with, you know, traffic in different ways that on-premise really struggled with. So, you know, making that move truly liberates these folks and, and gives them, you know, the possibility to, sky's the limit, really, at this point. Um, the important thing to really think about, though, and, and this is, you know, nothing, this is probably the most important part, right? A lot of people have the idea, hey, we want to go to the cloud. There are obviously two great, in, for the Fed space, two great options for a foundation for the cloud with AWS GovCloud and Azure Government. Um, you've got really good foundation there. But what's extremely important is that, you know, the steps are taken and well thought out to make the experience correct so that the performance is exceptional and, you know, they can really realize all those advantages. And it really starts out with architecting. So when we go, you know, when we start conversations with, with a company or an organization, you know, that, that in those initial explorations into what's happening, you know, what, what pieces of software are they using? What third party integrations are taking place? You know, what do their workflows look like? What is their database size? You know, and architecting out an environment to truly support that is extremely important because if you don't do that, then everything subsequently kind of falls apart. And, and that part takes time to do it right. You know, if you were to look at one of our assessments, and I'm sure the other organizations that do this as well, assessments are pretty lengthy. You know, this isn't a quick questionnaire. This is a, a process by which, you know, they have to provide a lot of information. There's a lot of exploration phone calls. Um, but, but if that's done right, then you have a terrific, solid kind of foundation to move forward. And that next step is that kind of the, the migration planning. And this is where, the best part of this, it's probably the most client intensive in some ways, but the best part is we talk about, you know, it's an opportunity for these organizations to clean the closets, right? How many times have you, <laughs> well, you know, do you need 1200 map services that you've had around since gosh knows when, like the mid nineties, you know, this is a great time to really look for these organizations to look at, Hey, what do they need today? And more importantly, also, you know, what's coming up in the future? And let's take that with us to the cloud. Let's start fresh, let's start clean and, and make that move. So, you know, for, for the groups that have been kind of uh, hesitant to, to, to donate to Goodwill, you know, that takes a little bit of time and thought, but it's a great part of the process and it gets them into, you know, a, a terrific environment. So we work with, you know, folks throughout that, through, through that process. Um, and then it comes down to implementing. And truly, if the first two are done correctly, if the, the architecture is done, been done correctly, if the migration planning is right, has been done right, by the time you actually are implementing these systems, 
you know, that can be a very easy, painless process and, and oftentimes surprisingly so for these groups because there is, even if there is the want to go to the cloud, there is still that fear, right? Because it's unknown and yeah, unknown is scary, right? So that planning piece really makes that implementation go great. And when it comes to that, you know, the, to the end uh, and, and they're actually turning off that on-prem and they're going live, by the time they get to that point, there's a high level of confidence because they've seen everything working. They've tested out, you know, those workflows, all their remote desktops are up and running great. And, you know, it becomes a very easy, painless experience. So, you know, again, I would just say, you know, that when you're talking to, you know, your organizations that want to move because they want to expand, you know, their use of enterprise, you know, just let them know, you know, it's really important to invest a lot in the front end when it comes to, you know, working with whatever vendor or internally on architecting out the environment and then on that migration planning. So it'll make it a much better experience. So a little bit about what we do at Rock, um, we pretty much help with each piece of that puzzle, right? So, if, you know, for groups that just want an assessment, so they want someone to come in and, and look at their existing GIS and help them architect out an environment, you know, they may have a great IT staff, um, you know, that, that can build the environment and get it going and install and configure the software. They just need some help with the architecture. We do that, and have done that numerous occasions. Um, for activating, if they need someone to, again, just help with the architecture and then getting them into the cloud, we can do that. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, there sometimes you run into organizations that have a strong IT that's cloud oriented and they really understand how to build out, you know, spin up servers and create the security around it and, and all of that good stuff. But where they might struggle is, is that migration part, right? I mean, installing and fit, configuring the software correctly. Um, getting those workflows stood back up correctly so that everything runs the way it should. Um, so even in some cases, we've literally just done that piece of it because there is a little hesitation around, around that. Um, so that's obviously possible. And then we also provide the ongoing managed services um, for those environments. And what that really consists of is taking kind of all the pressure off of IT and GIS administration so that they can focus on GIS. And we handle everything. So from the actual cloud stack itself to ensuring like intrusion detection, all of the OS patches and upgrades that come, you know, our team is doing. Um, backup and retention, ensuring those policies are being adhered to. And that, you know, if anything were to happen to those servers, we can get everybody spun up um, and back at work as quickly as possible. You know, in the past, that was that that responsibility did fall on IT, and we're seeing kind of more and more again a, a trend towards let's move that responsibility or shift that responsibility out of the organization so that we can focus on other things. And for the GIS team, you know, getting if they want an upgrade, it's a phone call, right? There's not a long process they need to go to. It's calling the managed service provider and saying, hey, we'd like to go to 1081. Um, for example, right now, as when we look at across our ecosystem of organizations here at Rock, uh, we have 94% of them have already upgraded. And that's because, you know, we were on a schedule and boom, 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 got them all through. And it was great. And the, the few that aren't are version left for reasons that, that have to do with third party software that we're all working through together to try and um, remove those barriers from other software. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really great kind of, again, like a liberating experience and it allows people to uh, continue to just do GIS and expand on their services rather than work on, you know, maintenance and, and um, all the fun nuances that can come along with that. And last but not least, oh, what's what I think is really important or what we get asked a lot is, you know, we do not sell as we licensing, we're not a reseller. So everyone who works with us, all of our clients bring their own as we licensing to the table. Uh, and, and again, you know, we don't resell that. We help install and configure it, we maintain it, but we don't sell it. And last but not least, you know, we are open to partnering with everybody. We've, we've partnered with a lot of different um, companies on certain implementations. And we uh, are partner with you know the Esri team all of the time. So we really look at this as you know this movement is not slowing down; it's only growing. Um, the complexity of some of these systems is only getting greater, and we all have some terrific you know uh, skill sets to bring to the table. 
So, you know, we're absolutely open to partnering with folks. We reach out to folks to um, organizations all the time for various reasons. So, if, you know, if you're interested, if you, if you want to reach out, we're always here. We'd love to work with you. Um, so thank you for your time. You can email me directly at acolman at rocktech.net or just sales in general if you want to uh, email that and go that direction. But really look forward to working with all of you and thanks for your time this afternoon. Mm -hmm.